Father, we, we need your instruction um, as we look at your word. Uh, so I would pray that you would, through your Holy Spirit, enable us to understand it. And God, as I always pray, uh, that we would be able to live it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week I was riding in my car and had the radio on uh, to a Christian station, and the news came on. And this was, while this lesson was just fresh in my mind, I'd been working on it and studying it on, on it all week, and um, the news reported something out of Stanford University, that they have uh, appointed a new campus chaplain who is an avowed atheist an atheist and their justification in doing so is that there are those at the university who don't believe in God and they need help also uh, and so I mean I'm sitting there just uh, driving and getting madder and madder and you know my horror uh, a chaplain that doesn't believe in God uh, you know call him a counselor but don't yeah, call him a chaplain um, you know, there's, yeah, yeah, because there's no spiritual help that this man is going to be, I'm assuming it's a man, that this man is going to be able to give to those who come to him. Um, and that's exactly what we see in today's lesson, in God's condemnation of the spiritual leaders of Jeremiah's day. Uh, and in case you think, well, that doesn't apply to me, I'm not a spiritual leader, we are all spiritual leaders if you are a Christian. That's what Jesus meant when he said we were to be salt and light in a dark world. Leadership is influencing others. And you don't have to have a special title to be a spiritual leader. If you are a Christian, God wants to use you as salt in light and light in a dark world. And that means you're a leader, <laughs> whether you volunteered to be one or not. So this does apply to you, and it applies to me as well. Um, so let's look and see how God holds the spiritual leader accountable to him for the way that he leads. Um, the first thing that God deals with through Jeremiah is the spiritual leader's conduct, and this is in 23, 9 through 15. Now remember that this is God's last warning to the nation of Judah before he brings judgment on them. Um, it, 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 we saw last week uh, that he gave this sa scathing attack of the civil rulers, the, the last four kings of Judah, uh, who were self-serving in their uh, reigns. They were there for self-advancement rather than for service to the nations, to the nation, um, and so uh, today we're seeing God's dealing with the spiritual leaders because you see behind the kings there was always prophets there were always pe those that were the spiritual leaders uh, the prophets were there to keep the king on track if you remember when David committed his sin uh, with Bathsheba and and ultimately ended in the murder of her husband Uriah who came to, to David. It was Nathan, the prophet, who came to convict him of his sin and to get him back on the right track. And so behind the kings would be the spiritual leaders, the prophets of the country. And so that's why this failure in this spiritual leadership was such a tremendous blight on the nation. Um, and so uh, Jeremiah has to deal with it as God speaks to Jeremiah and you see immediately the contrast between Jeremiah's leadership and the leadership of the nation of Judah. Uh, his heart was that of a true shepherd. Uh, as he looks around and as he sees the condition of his nation and as he hears God's word coming to him about the condition, uh, his heart, he says, is broken within him. He is uh, trembling, his bones are trembling. He says he is mourning this condition of, of his nation. He says he's like a drunken man, staggering, overcome with wine because the Lord's had spoken to him and had given him his word. Um, and Jeremiah is seeing not just the condition 
but also the consequences. And I think both were important, and both were ca a cause for mourning uh, for Jeremiah. And so, um, in uh, verse 10, then, he is grieving the sin of the nation and the condition of it. Uh, he says, the land is full of idolaters. Um, it, sin was not only present, it was prevalent. It, the land was full of people who were unfaithful, and that idolaters is not, not just spiritual idolatry, I shouldn't say just, uh, not spiritual, only spiritual um, adultery and unfaithfulness. Um, as they worshipped other gods and so on, but it was physical adultery as well. Uh, the the practices of the nation of Judah uh, were, were they had homosexual practices, heterosexual practices, all within the the um, guise of worship, and so uh, this is a condemnation of that kind of of condition and. Uh, I think Jeremiah could have listed, you know, several pages worth of sins, but this is the one that, that God is zeroing in on at this particular time. Uh, and Jeremiah sees that condition of adultery that's going on all through the nation, um, but he also sees the consequences of it. Uh, because of what's been going on spiritually in the land, uh, it has become a curse. He says the land is parched, the pastures are withered. Um, so God is already bringing judgment on the nation even before uh, he has the nation taken away in complete captivity. Uh, but he is putting the, the condition of the nation wholly and completely on the shoulders of the spiritual leaders. And that's where it needs to be when a nation goes awry. Uh, and that's in verse 11. And you remember the, the, pers the, the purpose of the spiritual leaders uh, was very different. The priests were to represent the people to God. The priests offered the sacrifices for the people and they would then represent the people to God. The prophets, on the other hand, represented God to the people. They were the ones that were given the word of God by God himself. And then they took that word and gave it to the kings and to the people. And so both the priests and the prophets are guilty of the sin that the nation is going to be judged for. Uh, Jeremiah says that the prophets follow the evil courses um, and use their power unjustly. That's in verse 10. They weren't in a serving position and mindset, but were simply using their position for their own power. Uh, and then he says the prophets and the priests are godless. Verse 11, they both are godless. And he says, even in my temple, God is saying, I find their wickedness. So it was religious sin that was involved in, in all that was going on. Uh, and the meaning of godless is simply to have a mindset that leaves God out. <laughs> it's, um, it's being without God. It's acting as if he doesn't exist. It's taking no concern for him. It's not obeying him. Uh, and somehow we, we feel that the spiritual sin, the sin that's involved with religious people is the worst kind because they're supposed to know better. They're supposed to be doing something different than what they are doing. And so the consequences for them are going to be very severe. God says in verse 12, therefore, their path is going to become slippery, they're going to be banished to darkness, and there they will fall. Um, I will bring disaster, God says, on them in the day or in the year they are punished. Uh, I thought that was interesting because it, it just shows us that God doesn't have to punish sin immediately. He can take his time in, in bringing about that judgment, uh, but it will come. And when it comes, um, it's going to come very hard on those who, who have um, a knowledge of what 
is good and right before God and even a pretense of it and yet are doing something very different and so the conduct then is revealed as God exposes the sin and um, I think this is important he talks about the nation of Israel first that ten tribe nation the northern tr nation the, the capital became Samaria and so he's calling it Samaria here and he said, now they've already been taken in captivity. Uh, and he says, you know, that they prophesied by Baal, and that was repulsive to God, verse 13. Uh, it was that mixed religion that you can read about in 2 Kings chapter 17, where the king of Assyria comes in, takes all of the countries in that area, and then finds that the people in each country spoke different languages, they had different religions, they had different gods, and there was a problem, and the king saw this problem that they don't know the God of their country, and so God is sending lions among them and killing some, and so his solution is to send pre a priest in to teach the people in each of these different people groups about the God of that particular people group, so that they're they would obey him and, and the lions wouldn't come. And of course, what happens is a deliberate mixing of the nations that have been taken by Assyria so that the religion becomes very mixed. Um, in fact, Second Kings um, 17 says that they worshiped God, but along with other gods. So it was all a big mixture. And this was repulsive to God. Uh, because it was leading his people astray and yet I think that it was not as repulsive as what Judah was doing because in Judah's case verse 14 God says it's horrible it's horrible what they are doing and the the sin that he zeroes in on is this adultery and living a lie this hypocrisy religious hypocrisy when they are spiritually and physically unfaithful to God and to one another um, with homosexual behavior, heterosexual behavior, all in the name of worship. Um, and I think it's worse because, first of all, they had the light of Israel's judgment. They had seen what happened to Israel, and so they knew God would, would, could bring about judgment. Uh, but also, they had the additional light of the very fact that the heart of the worship of Jehovah God was in Judah. It was in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was built. That's where the priests would come to offer their sac the sacrifices for the people. So that the they, uh, at the very heart of the worship of the one true God is all of this uh, sin that's taking place even in the name of worship. And so, um, as a result of the religious leaders' sin, the priests and the prophets, God said, you know, it, it's not just a matter of it being harmful to, the, to themselves. He said, uh, they are strengthening the hands of the evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness uh, because they had failed to lead in righteousness as they were, had been called to do. And so their influence was not for good, it was for evil, that's in verse 14, and God said, they're like Sodom and Gomorrah to me. And we just know those two names of a city where the, the homosexual sin was so immense that the very men of the city come to Lot's house and want to break down the door to try to, to get into these visiting angels um, and perform homosexual sex with them. So it was a, uh, and, and God said, Judah's just like them. Um, and so God says, it's a result, there's judgment that's going to come, verse 15. Um, he said, I'm going to make the prophets eat uh, bitter food and drink poisoned water. He said, this ungodliness has spread throughout the land and the leaders are responsible for what is going on. But you see, it's the spiritual, uh, co the conduct of the spiritual leader that is going to reveal whom he worships. He is going, it's going to reveal the one that he worships and it's going to eventually affect those he leads. It's got to. Um, and so as people look on the spiritual leader, all they can see is his behavior. They don't see his heart. Uh, we, don't, we can't read one another's hearts. 
all we can do is look at one another's behavior and if that behavior is ungodly if it does not speak of, of the one true God and reflect that one true God then we are leading people astray that's why Tim, uh, Paul wrote to Timothy um, that he was to teach elders that they were to be above reproach they were to have holy lives as they led the churches in that first century and in the centuries um, that have come since then um, and I'm not talking about perfection we know that we're not going to reach perfection this side of eternity but there is a vast difference in somebody who is genuinely and earnestly <coughs> following after the Lord Jesus Christ and it's his life is being Christ's life is being conformed um, and formed in this person there's a big difference between someone like that and someone who is a hypocrite and just simply living for himself and we see it and the world sees it and we're led astray by that kind of leader so from the conduct of the false prophets now God goes in to address the another issue and this is the message of the false prophets what they were giving out uh, and this is in verses uh, 16 through 32 uh, where God exposes the three issues really that um, was the problem with the message and the first issue was they were giving the people false hope in verses 16 through 20 he said you're speaking visions from your own mind but not from the mouth of the Lord uh, they weren't his mouthpiece which is what the prophet was supposed to be he said uh, uh, you are saying to to those who despise me this is God speaking oh you'll have peace God loves you you know um, uh, there's not going to be you know a taking of this land it's God's land and these are the very people that God says are following the stubbornness of their hearts and then saying no harm is going to come to you we're all okay um, and it was not the truth that God had been giving like to Jeremiah it was what the people wanted to hear and so the prophets gave it to them all about God's love and their privileged position as covenant people of God and the fact that there was not going to be judgment that God wouldn't do that but you know that trying to please the people is the temptation of every spiritual leader I have felt it so many times it's so much nicer to be able to give out a popular message it's so much more fun everybody loves you and they want to be with you and they want to follow you and and you know because they like what you have to say and uh, you know the spiritual leader can offer all kinds of, of good programs and and entertainment and all kinds of things that appeal to people and so people flock to them to hear a, a good message uh, and they can be sort of a divine psychiatrist and you know fix their problems and and um, meet their emotional needs and and all the other felt needs that they have and be sort of like a spiritual Santa Claus giving it out um, but what happens is their message is lethal it's deadly uh, because where there is no sin there is no forgiveness and so the message that is given out is one that is going to lead to death because people aren't hearing the truth they're not going to repent of their sins and take the one provision for sin and what happens with leaders like that is that you have a big following of all kinds of happy comfortable complacent people but they may be headed straight to hell now the the reason that these prophets were not giving the word of God is very clear in verse 18 they had not stood in the counsel of the Lord and seen and heard what he had to say to them heard his word um, and that picture there of that divine that standing in the counsel of God is is the picture of the the king with his trusted followers his trusted few like King Arthur and his round in the round table um, those few that would be privy to the very mind of the monarch as he gave out his plan 
and his purposes and so on. And these people, these false leaders, had not gone into the very counsel of God to hear what God had to say to them um, in that intimate fellowship. There was no time for God. They hadn't read his word. They didn't hear his word. And therefore, no truth was given out. Uh, you know, the most important activity that a, a spiritual leader and therefore a Christian can, can um, be about is also the hardest thing to do. And that's to go into the counsel of God and, and stand and hear and, and see what he has to say. Um, it, it's easier to prepare a sermon and to do all kinds of research and to give out interesting facts and so on and so forth than it is to stand in the counsel of God and be changed by what he says and, and what you hear. Um, and yet that is the most important thing that a spiritual leader can do. Um, and when we don't do that, we can give out all kinds of wrong messages of false hope, no judgments coming. But in verse 20, he says the anger of the Lord is going to accomplish what he has purposed. I read one leader today, uh, or this week, that said effective leaders are sensitive to others' feelings, but they seldom score at the extreme feeling end of the scale. The habit of holding up a wet finger to the winds of public opinion is not leadership. You know, it's not going to be leadership when we find out what everybody wants and then give out that message. Okay, so it was a false hope that was being given out in the message. The second thing was a false authority. In verses 21 through 23, they were self-appointed. They weren't from God. He said, I didn't send these pre pro prophets, yet they have run with their message. Verse 21. Uh, remember, the prophet's call was to hear the voice of God and give that out, to say, thus saith the Lord and give it to others. Um, and there is a big difference between speculation and conjecture and revelation. Big difference. Um, uh, you know, an example is, you know, if the, if the president is having an important meeting with his trusted few, uh, the, the reporters might have all kinds of speculation and conjecture on what's going on in this meeting. But they could be absolutely wrong. It's not, the truth isn't known until the press secretary or the official representative comes out and reports what's going on in this meeting. And that's the difference between uh, those giving out speculation and conjecture versus those that are giving out the very revelation that God has given to them as he did uh, for the prophets. And once again, God says, now, if they had stood in my counsel, um, they would have spoken my word to the people. And would you look at the amazing results? I mean, this is God saying, they would have spoken to my people with those amazing results. In verse 22, the people would have turned from their evil ways and their deeds. They would have repented and heard and, and ch be changed by this message. The word would not have fallen to the ground empty. Uh, God promised that through Isaiah. If these people had been hearing the word of God given out in God's authority, they would have changed because it's God's power to change. That's what he does, verses 23 and 24. He says, am I not a God that's uh, just nearby? He said, no, I'm omnipresent. I'm everywhere. Uh, he said, no one can hide in secret places. He's omniscient. He knows everything. We can't hide anything from him. He said, don't I fill heaven and earth? He is transcendent. He is above all. He is beyond all. He is over all. And that's why when his word is given out in his authority and in its truth, then there's going to be a change in the lives of the people who hear it. Um, and that's the authority that comes from God's word to convince and to convict and to change a person. When they hear, thus saith the Lord, God moves them 
to uh, hear and to change. Uh, and it's from God's revelation in his word, not just conjecture given by some person. Um, okay, so it was false authority, but it was also false inspiration, verses 25 through 32. Their message came from their own dreams. And he said, you know, the, in those days, of course, we know that there was, there was not the completed scriptures or anything. They were making the scriptures at that time by, by their prophecies. But um, so inspiration from God often came through visions and through dreams. And these false prophets were running around saying, I have a dream, I have a dream. You know, this wonderful vision from God. Um, and then they turn around and give out lies that are simply delusions of their own minds, according to verse 26. And will you notice in verse 27, it wasn't accidental. It wasn't they were just, you know, sadly mistaken. It was intentional. They think their dreams will make people forget my name, is what God said. It was an intentional <coughs> desire to turn the people from the worship of the one true and living God to the delusions of their own minds. And so God says, that's not what you're to be giving out. What you're to give out is the one, is my word. He said, let the one who has my word speak it faithfully, verse 28. Uh, it was just before I was trained for, um, in clear back in Oakland, California, um, to be a teaching leader for Bible Study Fellowship that I sat down and read Jeremiah and, and just the Lord was using it in a tremendous way. And I will never forget coming across that verse. And knowing very well that I am not a dynamic speaker, knowing very well that I am not the kind of personality that can walk into a room and command you know, instant attention and, and entertain people and tell funny jokes and you know, all of that. And so I felt very inadequate at, at giving out the Word of God. And yet God used this verse so clearly in my own mind to, to confirm to me that it wasn't entertainment that he was looking for. He was not looking for a comedian or uh, someone that you know could, could wow the crowds or anything. He wanted somebody who had God's Word and was willing to give it out faithfully. And that verse has been, um, I think, my life verse, my ministry verse, certainly, in the last 35 years. Um, uh, and yet we live in a time in which people are more sensation-seeking now than they were in Jeremiah's time. Uh, we love the, the you know, sensation of, of uh, you know, the experiential and what's exciting and, oh, did somebody have this dream or this vision or whatever? And uh, people crave it. And so it's being given out in a lot of pulpits. It's being given out in a lot of t through a lot of TVs, through the Internet, and so on and so forth. And people swallow it, hook, line, and sinker, even if it conflicts with the Word of God. Uh, and it's not, there's not, nothing wrong with being funny, uh, you know, or, or uh, being a dynamic speaker or anything else, but if it conflicts with the Word of God or if that's what the person is resting on, then we've got a problem. Um, because there's just no greater power than God's Word that's given out faithfully, um, even by ordinary, unspectacular type people, but people who are willing to study the Word of God and give it out. Um, and he says, that he, he's going to bring judgment on those who are, are giving out this false message. Verse 30, he said, therefore, I'm against them. I'm not for them. Um, they have stolen words that, they, that um, were supposedly from me, God says. They wag their own tongues, but they say it's from God. And he said, those who prophesy these false dreams and lead others astray with their reckless lies, I didn't appoint them or send them, and they don't benefit the people in the least way. Verse 32, they can't help the people when they're giving out a false message. The only message of eternal benefit and hope to a hurting people is from the Word of God. That's the only thing that's going to, to handle the depth 
of, of our sin and our problems that we live with, whether it's personal sin, whether it's a physical problem, whether it's a rate relational problem, whether it's financial, whether it's spiritual, whatever, we live in a broken world and we all have horrible problems that we are dealing with uh, and we're all broken. Some of us more broken than others, but the fact remains we are all broken people and there is no quick fix uh, to our brokenness. Only God's Word brings hope and help and eternal benefit to them. Um, otherwise, it's just a band-aid on a, a gangrenous sore, sore um, and it's not going to do any good, and it even masks sometimes the real thing um, that would lead to death. God's message um, it has to be in, given in truth with his authority and under his inspiration, under the, the word of God. Um, uh, one author I read this week said that without justice a nation suffers, but without truth it sickens. And of course what is not healed then dies. Um, so our nation is in danger of losing the truth because it has been given out relatively for so long, um, a message that, that isn't from the Word of God, but just given out to please people. And you know, you can go into any bookstore, you can go onto the internet, and there are volumes and volumes of books addressing every problem we could possibly have and giving advice on that. Um, you know, parenting, marriage, um, relationships, emotional problems, so on. <laughs> um, but we need to re recognize the difference between human wisdom and God's wisdom, what God has given in his word. Um, and we need to keep in mind that the only eternal truth is that which is given to us from God's word. And that is where our hurting mankind needs to have um, their, their hurts addressed is from the word of God to be given, yes, the, sin, the knowledge of the sin, but also the solution that goes with it as, as the leaders stand in the counsel of God and then give out what has been given to them. Now, Jeremiah attacks the, con or, I mean, the attitude of the leaders in this last division. Um, and um, uh, in this division, uh, people are coming and asking uh, what is the oracle of the Lord? That's NIV, um, ESV has the burden of the Lord. And the word there is massa, and it means lift up. Uh, and it, um, it originally meant in terms of lifting up the voice of a prophet or lifting up a burden. Uh, it was used in Jeremiah 17 when Jeremiah was condemning the working on the Sabbath, and he said, you're lifting burdens, you're carrying burdens. Uh, that was the same word that was used. Um, but it also can be the burden of a message that is put on the heart of a prophet. Um, and that's why it's translated in some Bibles as oracle, the prophet's word being given out as an oracle or a burden that God has put on his heart to give out that word. Uh, but in uh, Jeremiah's day, that what is the oracle of the Lord what had become such a cliche, and it was a matter of mockery and making fun of Jeremiah. You know, people would come, oh, what's God told you today? You know, what, what has he given you today? Um, and so he said, people are asking, but it was being asked in a deri deri as a derision and in a mockery tone of voice. And so God condemns that kind of attitude that's careless and disrespectful of his word and the message that he has to give to people. And so God says, forget asking for a burden or a, an oracle. He said, don't bother. Every man's word has become an oracle. You know, you hear it from everyone and it's going to be different. But the result is that they are distorting the word of God and giving out something that isn't his. And he goes on to say in verse 33, according to ESV, you are a burden of the Lord, you who have this attitude. Um, and so he said, I will forget you and cast you from uh, my presence along with the very city that I gave your fathers um, and bring everlasting destruction and disgrace and um, that's not going to be forgotten. Now, today's 
attitude, I think, is very much like the attitude in, in uh, Jeremiah's day. We have an interest in special topics in the Bible um, if, it, if it touches on our area of need. And I have people all the time saying, you know, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about, you know, marriage, family, end times, whatever? Um, but there is little inclination for an in-depth study that is taking the whole counsel of God from beginning to end and not just taking a topic and telling you what the Bible says on that topic so you can do that and be okay and not be bothered with all the rest of the stuff. It's minimizing and devaluing the whole Word of God, the whole counsel of God. And it's not seeing God's Word as the very nourishment that I must have in order to live spiritually, that my soul languishes without it unless I'm willing to feed upon it day by day and take into it the spiritual nourishment that I crave and need as badly as I do the physical nourishment that I take into my body. Um, and so God gives this vision to Jeremiah to show these two different responses to God and to his word in these, these baskets of figs. And of course, it's very clear, one basket is good figs, wonderful to eat. The other basket is, uh, are bad figs that are inedible. And God explains the vision, what this means. The bad figs were, were Zedekiah and all who refused to submit to the will of God and to God's command concerning the Babylonians. Remember what he had commanded, that they, would, they were to come out of the city and they were to submit to the captivity, go with the Babylonians into exile and captivity, and there God would take care of them. And yet these are people that, no, we've got to fight. You know, we've got to defend our city. We're, we're not going to let them take us. Um, but the good figs, he said, are those that would heed his word and obey him. Um, and those were the people that God said would go into captivity willingly and because they trusted God in that. And he said there his eyes would watch over them. He would bring them back to the land. They would be his people and I their God and they will return with all their hearts. Now, we are going to see as we go through Jeremiah uh, that God gives that promise over and over again. And indeed, he did bring back those that were in captivity back to the land. 70 years later, you're going to, I'm giving you an answer to your next week's questions. <laughs> um, but the promise goes beyond just a return to the land, it goes into a spiritual restoration as well, that their hearts would be turned back to him. And we know that when the Jews came back to the land that idolatry was never again practiced. But the sin of the nation was simply changed from idolatry to legalism because that's what we see 400 years later when the Lord Jesus Christ goes to those very people and they were particularly the religious leaders were uh, very legalistic and self-righteous in their viewpoint to the point of rejecting the very one they were to expect and to welcome the Lord Jesus himself and so the hearts were not made right at that point in terms of, of God's solution to sin. And of course that solution is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the re reason he came. That's the reason that he went to the cross was so that sin would once for all be dealt with as the one promised by God. And so a true spiritual leader like Jeremiah is going to see not only the reality of sin in his people, but the resource for that sin as well. The very fact that what we do about sin is we take it to the sin bearer of the world, the, the Lamb of God, who took that sin upon himself on the cross. And so when we are with those um, we are leading, then we need to always be pointing 
toward the solution to sin, which is the cross, Jesus Christ and his life given in our place. Um, I love what a man named E. Stanley Jones has written. He said, the early Christians did not say in dismay, look what the world has come to, but in delight, look what has come into the world. Um, and he goes on to say, they saw not merely that sin did abound, but that grace did much more abound. And on that assurance, the pivot of history swung from blank despair and loss of moral nerve and fatalism to faith and confidence that at last sin had met its match. And that's in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way sin is dealt with. That's the only way sin meets its match is through the Lord Jesus Christ who paid for that sin in order that we might have power over that sin, might be freed from the penalty of that sin, and one day we will be absolutely um, away from the very presence of sin. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that um, you have given us the truth and that your truth is, has been recorded in your word um, and that we can, can study it. And God, I pray that that truth will come home to us even in this week, um, that we might see those we are influencing and that we might truly want to influence them for righteousness rather than for evil. And Lord, in order to do that, we've got to stand in your counsel. We've got to come into your presence and spend time with you. And so, Lord, I pray for that. I pray that every one of us this week will take that time to come into your presence and to hear and see from you, uh, from your word, and that we might be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen.